baby, and bienvenidos everyone to the Lineage Performing Arts Center. My name is Jose Zamora, and I'm a professor of ethnic studies at California State University Fullerton. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be doing kind of like a weird creative lecture with some art in the background and some music for you to enjoy. Uh, we're going to be talking about Dia de los Muertos, past, present, and future. Uh, just a little bit of a note, uh, no flash photography or facial recognition, please. Uh, let's go ahead and begin. Dia de los Muertos is not just one holiday, it's a set of traditions that date back thousands of years. The people that inhabit the land that we now know of as Mexico used to be thousands of different indigenous ethnic groups, each with their own religion, customs, and food, spanning all across Central and North America. And no, we weren't all alike. Each group had its own language, customs, tradition, and food, like I just said. And over time, groups merged together and scattered apart, and as that's happening, their cultures began to overlap, and you see a little bit of flavor of each and every single uh, generation. This is what uh, Harvard anthropologist David Carrasco called Cosmovision. And the principal belief behind Dia de los Muertos is put simply, that death is not the end. It is only one other part of the journey, a door that we must all walk through. Indigenous beliefs also detail that the world of the living is connected to the spirit world. And similar to other cultures, why does this happen in autumn? Well, autumn is often seen as a series of transitions between the life of spring and summer and the death of winter. And during those months of transition, the line between the world of the living and the world of the dead gets a little thinner. So the spirits are able to walk among us. And as is tradition, to confuse the spirits, People who participate in Dia de los Muertos often don costumes or paint their face so that they too can act like spirits and confuse the spirits. And some of the spirits, though, are welcome, like those of our dead loved ones who have passed on. The altars that we build for Dia de los Muertos are our ancestors' resting places, a pit stop before they continue on on the journey. And as you've seen, Candles guide our ancestors along with the smell of copal, a resin, and the marigold, the sembalzochi. It's necessary for you to put your ancestors' photo on the altar so they know where they're at, right? And their favorite foods and their favorite drinks so that when the ancestors arrive, they may rest. The colonial Catholic Church attempted to stamp out these traditions, but ultimately failed. So they tried a different approach. When you can't beat them, co-opt them. The Aztec mother goddess was known as Tonantzin, the one who gave birth to the creator Quetzalcoatl. She is seen as the goddess of motherhood and creation. But in order to become a mother, you need her other side, Kualikwen, the goddess of fertility and sexuality. Uh, these images of the mother goddess eventually merged together with the Catholic interpretation, thus resulting in the Virgen de Guadalupe. The Virgen de Guadalupe is only one symbol among thousands that ethnic studies, ethnic studies scholars like myself consider Catholic image with indigenous spirit. But like all human traditions, they change over time.
means of changes over the years since the conquest of Mexico. Most of the villages in Mexico begin the celebration with a Catholic mass, and then eventually a procession to the cemetery. The day before, families will go and wash the graves of their ancestors before they construct the altar. Candles and copal are lit to help guide the spirits to quite literally their resting place. It is said that the food that's left out for the spirits has no flavor the next day, and some people say that this is proof that the spirits have passed through. In the modern age, Dia de los Muertos has become a very trendy holiday that is exploited by influencers and corporations alike. When it's an indigenous woman painting her face like a skull, Western audiences repulse. But when it's a light-skinned, trendy influencer on Instagram, we, <laughs> when we rejoice, celebrate, and we buy 15. Just to make it clear, Dia de los Muertos is not Mexican Halloween, not in the slightest. Despite Disney's attempt to patent the name Dia de los Muertos, people have resisted and continue the tradition in the way that our ancestors have showed us. Many young Mexicans in the U.S. have had a cultural rebirth in the celebrations of Dia de los Muertos and celebrate it openly in places like Hollywood Forever Cemetery, La Calle Cuatro in Santana, or at home with your ancestors. With a sizable Mexican population, it's no wonder that the biggest celebrations outside of Mexico happen in Los Angeles, California. And as technology changes and humans adapt to their new te technological environments, Instead of putting a picture frame, families might put a tablet with a looping set of fit photos of their family instead of candles, maybe electric tea lights. And I want you all to remember that it's not the technology that desecrates the tradition. It's a lack of respect for the spirit of the tradition that robs it of its sacredness. Heading into an uncertain future that is threatened by capitalism, white supremacy, and climate change, our tradition will continue to persist and exist. But I wonder at times, do Mexicans exist in the future? had no Mexicans, my colleague as a young child began to wonder, do Mexicans exist in the future? I first got the idea to do these lectures about this topic when we went into remote learning and remote work in March of 2020. Through technologies such as Zoom, Instagram, YouTube, and Amazon, we were able to live a somewhat manageable existence. To me, this was neoliberal capitalism's wettest dream. All that big tech was waiting for was a crisis just like this one. Though some, mostly administrators and capitalists, view remote learning and remote work as technological marvels. But most of us despise the unhumane conditions caused by not just the pandemic, but what I'm calling our entrance into the cyberpunk age. Cyberpunk is a dystopian genre where corporations have become the new government and crime and violence are commonplace. But most of that crime and violence comes from the top down, which is what we call classist violence. The principal model of cyberpunk is high tech, low life. Essentially this means instead of fixing problems, capitalism slaps a shiny coat of chrome paint on it and resells it at a 50% markup. Capitalism creates new problems and then sells you a solution. The same goes for the systems of, of oppression caused by capitalism. A large part of what we do here in ethnic studies has been to pass down the stories of our ancestors to the next generation so that they don't forget our lives or our struggles. But can code help us preserve our heritage, preserve our lineage, preserve our ancestors? So let's talk about cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is a popular genre that uh, emerged in the 1980s because of authors like Philip K. Dick, 
who first began to depict the future as a bleak dystopia where humans merge with technology. So imagine the year 2121. Imagine being able to store your ancestors' data into a digital space and preserve their teachings and their traditions. Every time that I missed a loved one, I would just plug in and then sit with them on the patio. These are ethical questions that we as a species have not even begun to answer. How far is too far? So for the next part of this lecture, I'm actually going to unveil a new piece of art that I made just for this evening. Um, a lot of the times I wonder how I'll be remembered by my kids. And I wonder what my thought is going to look like. What kind of food they're going to have on it, what kind of drinks they're going to have on it. I just hope it's a full bar though. This piece is called Pijitaras de los Muertos. Let's go into the future. Thank you.